From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Author Interviews. Conversations with authors exploring the latest clinical research, reviews, and opinion featured in JAMA. Hello, and welcome to this JAMA Author Interviews podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nora Desis, Deputy Editor at JAMA and Editor-in-Chief of JAMA Oncology. Today, we'll be talking to Dr. Jeffrey Tesoyan, who's an Assistant Professor and Director of Translational Cancer Research in the Department of Urology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Dr. Tesoyan treats urologic cancer patients at Vanderbilt and the Nashville VA Medical Center, and his research is focused on the development and clinical application of diagnostic and prognostic tools to guide early detection and optimal management of prostate and other urologic cancers. Dr. Tesoyan is with us today to talk about a paper that's published in JAMA, Prostate Cancer Screening with PSA, Calicrine Panel, and MRI, a preliminary report from the ProScreen randomized trial on which he was an author of an editorial. Welcome to the podcast interview, Dr. Tesoyan. Thank you, Dr. Desis, and thank you so much for having me. So this was a very interesting study. Can you give us kind of a general context of why this study is being done now? What is its importance? Why the authors chose to really focus in on this particular topic? Absolutely. The story of prostate cancer screening over the last two decades has been an interesting one. We now have high-level evidence demonstrating the cancer mortality benefit of PSA testing, prostate-specific antigen. But we know from those same studies that there can be harms associated with screening. These harms largely stem from the poor specificity for the PSA test for cancer, meaning, of course, that cancer is just one of several potential causes of an elevated PSA. And as a result, Under a former, more traditional approach in which an elevated PSA routinely led to a prostate biopsy, approximately three-quarters of biopsies performed were negative, and of those that were positive, half of them detected the indolent, low-grade cancers that posed minimal risk of harm. So that ultimately meant that only around 12% of biopsies performed actually detected the higher-grade cancers that stand to benefit from early detection and treatment. And biopsies are uncomfortable and come with a low but non-zero risk of bleeding and serious infection requiring hospitalization. And so quite appropriately, over the past several years, clinical guidelines have incorporated the use of additional tools in men with an elevated PSA level to better identify those at risk of higher grade cancers most appropriate for biopsy. And those tools fall into two categories, imaging with multiparametric MRI and biomarker assays that are measured in blood or urine. But MRI and biomarker tests have differing performance characteristics and practical attributes, and how exactly to use them remains unclear. So this large randomized trial from Finland took what I believe is a very sensible approach to the clinical scenario, using both tools in a sequence that plays to their strengths. Can you summarize the main findings of the study for us? Patients were randomized to a screening arm or a control arm with no intervention. Patients in the screening arm first underwent a PSA test, and those with a PSA level three or higher proceeded to biomarker testing with the 4 calicrine panel, a blood-based biomarker assay. Patients with the positive biomarker test then underwent MRI, and those with a positive MRI proceeded to biopsy, which in this case included sampling of only the abnormal region seen on MRI. And this stepwise approach resulted in remarkably efficient selection of patients for biopsy. In the screened arm, 3% of patients ultimately underwent a biopsy, and roughly half of those were found to have high-grade cancer. We can compare that to use of PSA testing alone 
from the large European randomized screening trial in which, as mentioned, only around 12% of biopsies detected high-grade disease. So the rate of negative biopsies was substantially reduced. And the next question is, of course, about the detection of high-grade disease. Did we miss more of those using this approach? And it doesn't appear so. This first round of screening detected high-grade cancer in 1.7% of the screened population as compared to 1.8% in the early rounds of the PSA-only trial. And finally, the incidence of overdiagnosis of those low-grade cancers that are indolent was only 0.4% in the current trial, and that was an eight-fold reduction from the 3.2% observed with a PSA-only approach, or that more traditional approach in which an elevated PSA alone prompted a prostate biopsy. And so the early findings of the trial really reflect a great deal of success in achieving those three main objectives that had been set forth to improve the benefit to harm profile of PSA screening. One, to reduce the number of negative biopsies performed. Two, to reduce the overdiagnosis of low-grade indolent cancers. And three, and perhaps most critically, to preserve the detection of higher-grade cancers that stand to benefit from early detection and treatment. The number needed to invite to screening to avoid one prostate cancer death now compares quite favorably to other prevalent cancers. I think these findings reflect the remarkable progress the field has made, and the authors do deserve a great deal of credit. Wow, that really does sound promising. Were there any surprises in this study? And do you think the findings, I mean, they were done in a particular location, would they be generalizable across the world? It's a great question you ask. I would have to say the main limitation of the study, which is not a criticism of the authors, but simply the reality of the setting, as you mentioned, and that was a lack of racial diversity. Because we know that self-reported black men in the U.S. have increased prostate cancer incidence and mortality relative to white men. We also know from several studies that these outcome disparities in many cases are no longer observed when care is provided through an equal access system. So it's important to be clear that structural and social determinants of health are key drivers of outcomes and ensuring equal access to quality care is critical. In addition to that, we now know that there are differences in prostate tumor biology by self-reported race. And so acknowledging race as a social construct and a poor proxy for genetic ancestry, these differences are unlikely to be genetic, but they do nonetheless exist. And a failure to acknowledge and account for these differences could threaten to propagate existing and historical disparities in the same way that baseline differences in what we consider a normal PSA level between races weren't described until years after the widespread adoption of PSA. So we've made the challenge to ourselves and really to all of us in more diverse settings to ensure that the development, validation, application of clinical tools are performed in appropriately diverse populations to better ensure equity. And that has been and will continue to be a focus of our research group. So what is the clinical impact that this study will have, if any? So I think clinically, we know that we have two strong options to better identify patients with an elevated PSA that need to truly undergo a biopsy in biomarker testing and MRI. And I think in a world where cost is no issue, the approach used in this trial with biomarker testing followed by MRI is quite ideal. But in the real world, there are some very real practical considerations. We know that the performance of MRI is highly dependent on the radiologist reading that MRI. For example, the pooled negative predictive value 
of MRI at expert centers approximates 91%, but it is known to be as low as 63% at individual sites and as low as 40% among individual radiologists. So at clinical sites where the negative predictive value is acceptably high, depending on a given patient's risk tolerance, it's very reasonable to consider MRI as a first-line option and potentially the only option to guide that decision for biopsy. In other cases, particularly in settings where the performance of MRI is limited or is unknown, the use of an objectively measured biomarker test with validated negative predictive values in the mid to high 90s could be a more practical first line option to determine whether MRI and biopsy are really necessary. And acknowledging that longer term follow-up will provide further insight, I think this trial very nicely demonstrated the excellent short-term outcomes achieved with this type of stepwise approach to diagnosis. And everything will be made much easier once we have that artificial intelligence program that will be able to read those MRIs for us, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. That comes next. <laughs> Well, Jeff, thanks so much for being here and telling us about this very interesting study. And you're the perfect person to do it with your wonderful research that is really focused on guiding early detection of prostate cancer. So I really thank you for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Nora, for having me. It was a pleasure. This episode was produced by Shelley Steffens at the JAMA Network. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com. Thanks for listening.